Fina and I want to take a moment to extend a very warm welcome to everyone who is joining us here at Go Church Bradford's online service. Whether you're just having a look or are searching for a place to worship, we're delighted to have you with us. To give you some idea of what we're all about and what we believe, we are a family of churches working together to reach the world. The Go Church family consists of Beirut, Liverpool, Manchester and of course here at Bradford. Our vision essentially says this, it's family spreading the message of Jesus Christ all over the world. That's what we are trusting that God will do in and through the Go Church family. Now the message of Jesus is in our valleys because the message of Jesus is love. The Bible actually says that God is love. We want you to experience God's love, grow in God's love and go with God's love. Shortly we'll start our service with a time of praise and worship this is an opportunity for us to pour out our love for God, not just receiving his love, but us focusing on him. The Bible says that when we do this, that we can expect the presence of God to flood our hearts and our homes with his peace, his joy and love. After praise and worship, we will celebrate communion together. This is a reminder of what Jesus did for us through his death, his burial and resurrection. So, if you would like to get some juice and bread, and we will celebrate together. After communion, Pastor Matthew will preach a message titled, You Are an Overcomer. We pray that the Word of God will impact you today. So we encourage you to have a faith expectation that the Lord will minister to you as you're listening. But before we start, I want to invite you to like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, or if you're joining on Facebook, to start a watch party. We have had some powerful testimonies of people's lives being impacted greatly and through these online services. And it's so encouraging to hear what the Lord is doing throughout the world through these messages. So when you like and subscribe and share, you will enable these messages to go out all over the world. For now, why don't you join in and let's worship together.
But the grave cannot contain For you wear the Please. 
to celebrate communion this morning you might be asking what is Holy Communion? Well Holy Communion also known as the Lord's Supper represents the greatest expression of God's love for his people. Two items that are used in Holy Communion the bread which represents Jesus body that was whipped and broken before and during his crucifixion and the cup which represents his shed blood when Jesus walked on earth, he was vibrant and his body was full of life and health. But before Jesus went to the cross, he was badly whipped by the Roman soldiers and his body was torn as he hung on the cross. At the cross, God also took all our sicknesses and diseases and put them on Jesus' originally perfect and healthy body so that we can walk in divine health. That is why the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 24, that by his stripes we are healed. Jesus in Luke twenty two twenty tells us that the cup is the new covenant in his blood. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 1, 7, that the blood of Jesus brings forgiveness of sins. Why do believers partake of Holy Communion? Because besides being born again in Christ, a healthy body and mind are the greatest blessings anyone can have. And the Holy Communion is God's ordained channel of healing and wholeness. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus ate his last supper with his disciples. And knowing what he would accomplish through his sacrifice, he instituted Holy Communion. His loving instruction is that we are to remember him as we partake the Holy Communion. Jesus wanted us conscious of how his body was broken for our wholeness and his blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And whenever we partake in this, we proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Today, when we partake of the bread, we are declaring that Jesus' health and divine life flows in our mortal bodies. And when we partake of the cup, we are declaring that we are forgiven and have been made righteous. Jesus' blood gives us right standing before God and we can go boldly into God's presence according to Hebrews 4.16. When we pray, we can be sure that God hears us. How do I partake in Holy Communion? Well, before you partake, remember that Holy Communion is not a ritual or a formula to be observed, but it's a blessing to be received because it's not a ritual. So there is no prescribed bread or special drink required. In the Last Supper, Jesus used whatever he had at the table. Bread was commonly eaten at supper and whatever they were drinking. So the Bible says, for I received from the Lord 
what was also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son. By the stripes that fell on his back, my body is healed from the crown of my head to the very soles of my feet, that every cell, every organ, every function of my body is healed, restored and renewed in Jesus' mighty name. I believe and I receive. In the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me the Lord Jesus thank you for your precious blood your sin free disease free poverty free life because that is in your blood and your shed blood has removed every sin from my life through your blood I am forgiven of all my sins, past, present and future, and made completely righteous. Today I celebrate and partake of the inheritance of the righteous, which is preservation, healing, wholeness and provision. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving me. Amen. Hello and welcome back. My name is Mehmet Tapsaw and I, along with my wife Fina, pastor Go Church Bradford and it's a real privilege to do so. Now we are part of the Go Church global family and we are the ones that are based in Bradford which is a tremendous city. And this week I wanted to talk to you about being an overcomer. 1 John 5 verse 4 to 5 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And in those two passages of Scripture, verse 4 and verse 5 of 1 John chapter 5, we see overcomes, overcome the world, overcomes the world. We see the word overcome or overcomes three times. And that's the message that I want to get across to you today. That God believes and God sees you as an overcomer. God wants you to know, Jesus wants you to know, that you are an overcomer. Now the dictionary says that the word overcome means to get the better of in a struggle or to prevail over opposition. That's how God sees you. He sees you as someone who gets the upper hand in any struggle. Not the lower hand, you get the upper hand. He sees you as someone who prevails over opposition. He sees you as someone who overcomes. And you need to be an overcomer. You need to overcome. You and I need to be overcomers because the world has to be overcome. There is something that has to be overcome and it's called the world. The world has to be overcome. 1 John 5.5 5, Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? God expects us to overcome something. He expects us to overcome the world. Now the world, and I mentioned this last week actually in part two of Dressed to the Nines, that when the Bible says the world, it's often it's not talking about this physical realm. Almost always, especially in the New Testament, it is talking about a system of values, attitudes, beliefs that are contrary to God's values, attitudes, and His beliefs, what He believes. So the world is called ungodly. It's literally the word ungodly literally means without God. That's what ungodly means. And God's ways and the world's ways are contrary to one another. The world is constantly trying to convince you to do things, to live your life according to its ways, its standards, its values, its beliefs, rather than God's ways. For example, the world says, live your life by what you can see. God says, Live your life by what you can see. Live your life by what you believe in your heart. Live by faith. The world has a saying, I'll believe it when I see it. 
That's I mean, how many of us have heard that saying? I'll I'll believe it when I see it. God says, you believe it before you see it, which is completely contradictory to the message of this world. The world says, look after yourself first and foremost. You got to look after number one, and that's me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity, I call it. God says this in Philippians 2, verse 3 and 4, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. The world says, it's all about you, mate. It's all about me, myself, and I. Like I mentioned before, I call it the unholy trinity. It's all self-focused. But God says, yes, esteem yourself highly, but esteem others more highly than yourself. You know, the world has a saying, and how many of us have actually said this ourselves? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's such a common saying, and it's completely untrue, completely ungodly, because it goes completely against what God says. God says in Proverbs 18 verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. God says that words are actually much more impacting, more powerful than physical things. I mean, when you think about it, this whole physical realm came into existence by words, by words that God spoke forth. God says that your words have the power to create life or death. Jesus actually says that you will give an account for every vain word that you have spoken. You know, the world says, hold on to every little thing that you have. Be stingy because you never know what's going to happen. You got to look after yourself. You got to be a hoarder. Keep it all for yourself. God says in Proverbs 11 verse 24, 25, there is one who scatters yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich and he who waters will also be watered himself. And that's a message which is completely opposite of what the world says. Now, I'm not saying that you throw away all your money and your material possessions. I'm not saying that at all. But I'll say, say this, there have been times in my life when God has asked, spoken to my spirit, spoken to my heart. I'm not saying I heard an audible voice in this occasion, but I just knew by the Holy Spirit in my spirit, there was a knowing that I had to give someone some money. And I thought, Father God, Papa, I, I kind of need that money. I've got to feed my family, you know, and I don't know whether you are aware of my current financial situation, but it's not really looking the greatest. And right now, I kind of need that money. But I really sense in my heart, God say to me, Matthew, obey. Just give it to them. Now, I obeyed in faith. It really took faith. And honestly, at the end of it, I was just really pleased that I was able to be a blessing. We were able to be a blessing. But surely, very shortly after that, someone did that same thing for our, ourselves to a greater degree. You know, God was saying, give. Give, Matthew. Give by faith. Just trust me. The world will say, hold on to that, mate. That's all you got. You need to hold on to that and stretch it out as far as you can. You know, the world says that this is just a collection of cells of no worth or value, and it can be discarded and destroyed if it's inconvenient. God says in Psalms 139, verse 13 to 16, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written. Your days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. God says that this is not just a collection of cells and material, but a living being with an eternal value that will never change that is so precious and valuable that even before they are born, were actually even conceived, that he already had laid out a great plan for their life. That they are so precious that he is willing to die for that person, for that being, for that baby. God wants you and me to overcome the world and its message, to not yield to its message, to not yield to its pressure, but to overcome the lies, the untruths, the prideful message of an ungodly world. And instead to get the better, to, to prevail over this thing called the world. He wants you to be an overcomer. He wants you to overcome the world. He doesn't want us to be like Adam and Eve when the servant brought temptation to them. 
when he brought his way of thinking, of believing, his ungodly pride and his ungodly attitude. And then they yielded to it like, like Adam and Eve did. No, he wants you and me to be just like Jesus. When he, Jesus was tempted, he didn't fall. No, when he was tempted, he never fell into temptation. He never, ever sinned. And he was tempted in every way. Hebrews 4 verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was an overcomer. Jesus is an overcomer, sorry. So the world was constantly being put in front of Jesus. The world was constantly putting temptations in front of them. The Bible says he was tempted in every way. But he never sinned. Please note, being tempted is not falling into sin. Jesus was and is an overcomer. And God wants us to be an overcomer just like Jesus. We are called Christians. Those like Christ. That's what Christians means. Those like Christ. So Jesus is our standard. We can be an overcomer just like Jesus. The Lord is our standard. The Lord is our goal. We are looking to him to emulate Him, to be just like Him in the way we think, the way, the way we act, in our attitudes, to be just like Jesus. Now, sometimes people might say, well, who do you think you are trying to be like Jesus? Well, who else are we meant to be like? We're meant to be like Jesus for the Christian. He's the goal. And if we aren't trying to be like Jesus, then who, we are, who are we trying to be like? Jesus is the goal. We are meant to have the mind of Christ, the strength of Christ, the character of Christ. We are meant to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. And He is, was in the past, and always will be an overcomer. And so you are meant to be as well. When we overcome, then we are rewarded. One of the things that I see in the Bible is that when we are overcomers, when we overcome this world, we get rewarded. In the book of Revelation, which is the last book in the Bible, just in case you didn't know that, well, in the opening chapters, specifically looking at chapters 2 and 3, we see that Jesus is speaking to seven churches and encouraging them to be overcomers. Now, some of those churches at that time were really doing well. They were doing awesome. And the Lord was really just encouraging them to keep going strong and continue in that way to be overcomers. And quite a few of those churches actually weren't doing so well. And the Lord was encouraging them to up their game and actually be overcomers. But when he was telling them to overcome, he always made a point of telling them that they will be rewarded for overcoming. Revelations 2, 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelations 2, 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Revelations 2.26, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Revelations 3.21, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Revelations 21 verse 7, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So we see the Lord saying, When you overcome, that's you. There's a reward. There's a prize waiting for you when you overcome. And I tell you what, there is something about knowing that there is a reward, that there is a prize for what you are doing that enables you to keep going and not to quit. Because overcomers don't quit. When you are running the race, say a marathon race or whatever type of race it is, and you are tired and you're exhausted, and you see that finish line so, so far away, but you realize that if you get there first, you can get the prize. You can get the winner's medal that you will be rewarded. And that inspires you to keep going and overcome that exhaustion, that fatigue, and win the race. You know, one of the prizes that keeps me going and enables me to overcome fatigue and when I feel exhausted, which I tell you, we all have to face, we all have to face being tired and exhausted, is that I want to hear from the Lord's lips. I want to hear him say, Matthew, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful and little. I will put you in charge of much. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That for me is such a motivation. It inspires me to keep going forward, to not quit, to be an overcomer. I live for that moment. The reward of hearing that from my Lord's lips. The reward in the future enables us to keep going in the present. 
Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, looking away from all that will distract to Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith. Giving the first incentive for our belief and is also its finisher, bringing it to maturity and perfection. He, for the joy of obtaining the prize that was set before him, endured the cross, despising and ignoring the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. When you realize that there's a reward that you receive when you overcome, that is fantastic and great motivation to keep going, to not quit and be an overcomer. It's important that we overcome in this day and age because really this is the only time that we have to overcome. When we get to heaven, well, the time to overcome is gone. But right here, right now, at this present age, we have to overcome. So it's whether we overcome here and now that determines what our reward is in the future. Now, I'm not saying that us going to heaven, that us becoming a, ch a child of God is dependent on us being overcomers. The Bible is very clear that we cannot do anything to earn our salvation then nothing we do makes us children of God. We only become children of God when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior by faith. Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 9 says, For it was only through this wonderful grace that we believed in Him, nothing we did could ever earn this salvation, for it was the gracious gift from God that brought us to Christ. So no one will ever be able to boast, for salvation is never a reward for good works or human striving. So it's pretty clear and obvious that becoming a child of God and knowing for certain that you will go to heaven is not a reward for doing a whole bunch of good deeds. Our salvation only comes when we put our faith and trust in Jesus and receive him as our own personal Lord and Savior. Our reward, however, is after we become a child of God, a son of God, and then we overcome this world by faith when we serve God. Sons of God, male and female, are meant to serve God. We get rewarded when we serve our Father in heaven. And it's in the here and now that we earn our heavenly reward. And that's why it's important that we overcome in this day and age, because really, this is the only time that we have to overcome. And it's whether we overcome the world here and now that determines what our reward is in the future. Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this, the judgment. Now that word judgment there, it means different things depending as to whether you are born again Christian or not. What we need to focus on is that today counts. What you do today counts. Whether you overcome today counts. That is great motivation to keep going and be an overcomer. So when we overcome, we will be rewarded. And the way to overcome is by faith. We overcome this world by our faith. First John chapter 5 verse 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. How do we overcome this world? It's by our faith. We, every Christian, we are called to fight the fight of faith. It's the fight of faith that enables us to overcome this world. It's the only fight that we are, that the Bible says that we are meant to fight actually in the New Testament. God wants us to be overcomers and to walk in the fullness of the abundant life, live in triumph and victory that Jesus came to this earth to die for so that we could have. And because of Jesus, God has made available unto us spiritual blessings that will enable us to be overcomers. We just have to access them by faith. That's the way we access these spiritual blessings, which is by faith. For example, the blood of Jesus. Revelation 12 verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Now, when you study out the power of the blood of the Lamb, and really, I should do a sermon series on, on the power of the blood at some point in time. At some time, I will, but as always, you're meant to be led by the Holy Spirit in what you preach and teach. But we see some great benefits that allow us to be overcomers, that we access when we believe, when we are in faith about the blood. In Exodus, the blood brought protection from death. Exodus 12, verse 13. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. When the Israelites put the blood of the lamb on their houses, they were spared from death. They were protected. It's a symbol of what the blood of Jesus does for us here in the New Testament. The blood of the lamb brings boldness. Hebrews 10 verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Faith in the blood brings boldness. We are bold because we might be muscular, big or strong, anything like that. No, we are bold because of the blood of Jesus. 
we are bold because we know that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all of our sins and mistakes and makes us right in God's eyes. And that righteousness in God's eyes enables us to walk into His presence with a boldness. When you know that you are right with someone, that you there's no hindrances between you and them, it's so easy for you to be in their presence. And that's what the blood of Jesus does for us. The blood of Jesus, the Bible says, makes us right. It washes us clean so that we can stand before God with no hint of guilt or shame. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The blood of Jesus brings boldness. The blood brings redemption. 1 Peter 1, 18 verse 19. Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The blood of Jesus brings cleansing. 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus washes you clean. It's like you have the best bath ever. And you come out of that bath smelling and looking perfect. Not No hint of any corruption or dirt. You look perfect. When the blood of Jesus washes you, the blood of Jesus washes you. I'll say this, the Bible works when you believe it. When you put your faith in it, that's when the Word of God works for you and for me. In anyone's life, it, the Bible works when you believe it. And when you believe it, that's when you become an overcomer. Another blessing that enables us to overcome this world is the name of Jesus. When we access that name by faith, it has to be spoken and accessed by faith, then we can overcome this world. Now the Lord said in Mark 16 verse 17 to 18, And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Jesus is saying, if you have faith in my name, you will see these tremendous signs and wonders. Guaranteed. It's faith in the name. There's a great example of this in Acts, of having faith in the name of Jesus, enabling us to overcome this world. Acts chapter 3. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go in, into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. What enabled this man to be lame one moment and the next to be walking, jumping up and down to receive a miracle? It was faith in the name of Jesus. Faith. Like the Bible says in 1 John 5, 4, we defeat this world, we overcome this world by our faith. Faith is the key that allows us to access the blood of the Lamb and the power of His name that enables us to overcome. I want to quickly show us how it's important to have faith. Not just copy what you see other people do. That doesn't enable you to overcome this world. In order to overcome this world, you have to have real faith in your heart. Acts chapter 19, verse 13 to 16. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus. Now we mentioned that there's power in the name. We've seen in the previous example that there is power in the name of Jesus. We'll continue. To call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Here we see these people, the seven sons of Sceva. They were trying to use the means that Jesus has made available for us, his mighty name, to overcome this world. But for them, it didn't work. 
They tried to use the name of Jesus. They said the right things, used the right name. Actually, they threw in another name. They threw in the name of Paul as well, just to be safe. Sort of like a fallback option. But they didn't overcome the world. The world actually overcame them. Instead of them seeing a lame man walk, like Peter and John saw, they ended up hurt and lame themselves and naked. What was the difference between the seven sons of Sceva and the apostles Paul and John? The apostles had faith. They had faith in the name. The seven sons were just trying it and seeing whether it would work. Which if you are going to be in the deliverance ministry, I, I, I would not highly recommend at all. They didn't have faith. They didn't believe in their heart of hearts. I say this again. The Bible works. The scriptures come to life. The word of God changes our lives. The power of God is released when we believe the Bible. Not just quote it. Not just memorize it. But believe it in our hearts. When you, the real you, the spirit, what the, what the Bible says is the hidden man of the heart. When you hear the word and you believe the word, that's when the Bible works. Faith is the key that allows us access to the power of God in order to become overcomers. We overcome this world by our faith and we overcome by the greater one. 1 John 4.4 4, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You will overcome. You will live a life victorious. You will live a life of triumph. You will overcome this world because the Spirit of God, the greater one, is in you. I love how the scripture reads in the Amplified. First John 4, 4 again. Little children, you are of God. You belong to him and have already defeated and overcome them, the agents of the Antichrist, because he who lives in you is greater, mightier than he who is in the world. When you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, you became a child of God instantly. And in that instant, the Holy Spirit came into your life and made you a new heart, a brand new spiritual being. And when he came into your life, he brought power. He brought the power of God. Acts 1.8 But I promise you this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be filled with power. And you will be my messages to Jerusalem, throughout Judea, the distant provinces, even to the remotest places on earth. When you have the Holy Spirit, you have power. There's no situation, circumstance, challenging storm of life that you and I may be facing where the Holy Spirit goes, Oh, oh my, gee, gee whiz, that is too much for me. I sure hope that they don't ask the Father for help in this situation because I really don't know what I'm going to do here. No, that is never going to occur. I, I believe that believers today, the church today, has vastly underestimated the power of the Holy Spirit. You may wonder how I can be so sure of that. It's, it's kind of simple, really. If we truly understood and believed what the Bible tells us about the Holy Spirit, we would never worry about anything again. Or how has the offer could come against us and we wouldn't fear. We'd just grin and say, bring it on, devil. The greater one lives within me. And he has given me all the wisdom, strength, power, and provision I need to crush you like a bug. Now, right now, you may think, oh, man, I can never have that kind of boldness, Pastor Matthew. But let me ask you something. What would you do if Jesus appeared to you today? How would you act if he linked his arm in yours and told you that from now on, he will be with you in every situation? He will be physically present with you in all circumstances of life. If you became sick, he said, well, I'll just lay my hands on you and you're going to be healed. If you ran short of money, he said, I'll pray and multiply your resources. If you encountered a problem that you didn't know how to handle, he'll tell you exactly what to do. He's got the wisdom of God. Under those circumstances, you'd be very bold and confident, wouldn't you? Every time you ran into trouble, you just look at Jesus and go, it's going to be good. I've got Jesus. And you would have great courage. Of course, there's one problem there. The fact is you don't have that advantage. You don't have Jesus standing next to you in the flesh, taking care of your every need. But we need to realize that we have something better than that, actually. I realize it's difficult to believe that there's anything more beneficial and more amazing than Jesus physically being present with you all the time. But there is. Jesus said to himself, in the hours just before he was crucified, he told his disciples that he would be leaving them and returning to his Father in heaven. They weren't too happy about that at all. And when they expressed their sorrow and dismay, he said in John 14, verse 16 to 17, 
I will pray the Father and He will give you another helper, that He may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. Now to fully grasp the impact of that last statement, you have to realize that Jesus was talking to a group of men who had followed Him day and night for three years, they had seen His miracles, they had enjoyed perfect provision, and protection at his hand. They had seen the signs and wonders that he had done. And Jesus is saying this to them. Boys, it's going to be better for you when I'm gone. Because the Holy Spirit will, will come. And not only will he be with you. But he will be in you. Are you really looking to the greater one? When the challenges of life come. When the world tries to run you over. If you are aware of the Holy Spirit. If you're looking to the Holy Spirit. You will overcome. That's what the Word of God says. And I believe what the Word says. And lastly, overcomers make an eternal difference. Romans 5, 18 verse 19 says, Here it is in a nutshell, just as one person did it wrong and got us all in this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. But more than just getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong. One man said yes to God and put many people in the right. When you step out in faith, when you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, when you believe what God says in His Word, it affects not only you, but those around you. And it can affect them for eternity. It can determine where they will go for eternity. To heaven or to hell. One man couldn't overcome the world and the result was eternal death, despair and darkness. One man did overcome the world and the result was eternal life, joy and light. All it took was one man. When you overcome this world, you will make the difference of one. All it takes is one person to overcome this world, to see a massive change in a nation, in a world, in a family, in any situation in life. You will make an eternal difference when you are an overcomer. It's who God has called you to be. Be an overcomer today. 1 John 5, verse 4 to 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? The world has to be overcome. God wants us to be overcomers because there is something that has to be overcome, and that's the world. It's a way of thinking, believing, acting that is contrary to God's way of thinking, believing, and acting. When we overcome, then we are rewarded. There's a reward for you and me when we serve God. And that should be a motivation for us to not quit and to keep going forward in God's plan for our lives. We overcome this world by our faith. It's by our faith that we can access the blessings that enable us to be overcomers. The name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the grace of God. We overcome by the greater one. Jesus said it was better for us that he not be with us physically because then he could send us the Holy Spirit who is a spirit of power and might who enables us to overcome. Overcomers make an eternal difference. When we overcome this world, then we can make an eternal difference in not only our lives, but the lives of those around us. Hey, I've been talking about being an overcomer and how God wants us to be overcomers. He wants us to be able to stand against the storms of life, the challenges of this world, the temptations that come. He especially wants us to overcome hell and go to heaven. It's God's desire that you go to heaven. He wants us to live a life of freedom from fear, doubt, and despair, and to be in a place filled to overflowing with God's love, peace, and joy, and to be there for eternity. Now, how do we overcome hell and make heaven? It's really easy. You put your faith in Jesus. Faith alone in Jesus allows you to overcome hell and make heaven. Romans 10 verse 19 says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. If you would like to be an overcomer, the first step that you need to take is receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. If you want to overcome hell and go to heaven, that's the very first step that you, that you have to take. And all you have to do is say a prayer and mean it from the heart. And if you want to do that right now, repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I turn away from living for myself and I want to live for you. I believe you died on the cross for me. You were buried and on the third day you rose from the grave. I ask you into my heart to be my personal Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Come and take complete control of my life. Amen. 
If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, we believe that you just become a child of God. You just got born again. You just became a overcomer. We want to encourage you to get into a Bible-believing church and keep God, keep Jesus first place in your life. If you want to connect with us here at Go Church Bradford, you can do that via social media on Facebook or Insta or Twitter, or you can email us at bradford at gochurch.cc. For everyone who joined us online, thank you so much for taking the time from your weekend to connect with this church. We pray that you're blessed today. We love you all. Have an awesome week. God bless every single one of you all.